Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another episode of Coffee, the Bible and Page. I am Page, your caffeine-imbued host, and we are getting ready to start another devotional where I read a passage of Scripture and I think with my mouth open. So get a cup of coffee. Join me. We're going to begin, as we always do, with reading the Apostles' Creed and then right into our study. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the beginning, coffee. Lo, it was very good. Well, welcome to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page. I am indeed Paige, your Caffeine Imbued host. We're going to continue our jaunt into 2 Peter. Uh, just a, as an introduction, just in truth, where Peter spoke to persecutions from outside of the church in his first letter, the second letter, he's detailing trials from within the church brought on by false teachers and prophets. So we're going to get started right away. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Verse 1 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Well, what's a prophet? What's a teacher? Well, prophets speak on God's behalf. They're the ones that say, thus saith the Lord. Whereas the teacher tells us what God means. A false prophet, therefore, pretends to represent God, and a false teacher pretends to teach truth. They're dangerous in the fact that the really good ones are hard to tell the difference from them and the real deal. Now, verse 1 here asserts that Christ bought the false teachers. He said, uh, they will deny the sovereign Lord who bought them. Mm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these are real believers. All right. Salvation in the New Testament sense does not occur until the benefits of Christ's work are applied to an individual by the regeneration of the spirit and belief in the truth. In other words, Christ crucified is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the entire world yet is only really applicable to those who bow their knee to him. Sufficient for all, efficient for some, is, I believe, the saying. Or we could say on the other side of this, the wrath of God is on all sinners until the work of the cross is applied specifically to those who believe. So, these don't necessar- this does not necessarily mean that these are believers. Christ's death on the cross, as I said, is sufficient for all. But it's sufficient only for those who bow their knee to him. So when he says that uh, they deny the sovereign Lord who bought them, well, Christ's death on the cross paid for their sins as well. But that doesn't mean that they bowed their knee to him. They're false teachers. They're false prophets. Verse 2, he says, many will follow their depraved conduct, (laughs) that is, vices, sexual debaucheries, and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. The way was a common early name for the Christian faith. Such ungodly conduct brings reproach on the name of God or Christ because it's viewed as Christ giving his permission for such behavior. True doctrine must result in true living. And the truth of the matter is, in these false teachers, if you observe them long enough, you will see the truth of their life. 
James, we've quoted James before, and he says, you say you have faith, great. I, I show you my faith by how I live. Eventually, false teachers, false prophets will show the truth by how they live their lives. Um, how many times have we heard of Christian, famous Christian preachers or teachers uh, fall? because of their sexual proclivities for their uh, embracing of the world's lifestyle. Uh, I, I can think of half a dozen names right now. And prior to the truth coming out, everybody bought into what they were selling. Everybody bought into what they were preaching or teaching. I, I come from a Pentecostal back background and in the 70s and 80s, it just seemed like there was leader after Christian leader after Christian leader that was falling to sin whose lifestyles was brought out into the open and, and it destroyed whatever it was that they were building or had built. Oh, true doctrine must result in true living. So that gives us one thing we can use to determine who's a false teacher, who's a... Uh, a true teacher, their lifestyle. Now in their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories, that's verse three. Now Christian teachers have the right to financial support, but their motivation in the ministry should not be mercenary. For false teachers, religion will be commercialized. They will exploit people. They will say whatever they need to say to put your money in their pockets. Peter goes on to say their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. In light of the commercialization of religious cults today, Peter's warning is clear enough. But the popularity and prosperity of these errorists will certainly come to an end. Their judgment and doom have been announced long ago. Psalms 51. But so how can we be certain that these false prophets and false teachers are going to be punished? I mean, we see them getting away with it. I can think of half a dozen people today in who are who claim to be part of the faith. One has the largest church in America and he preaches heresy. But what he preaches is what his followers want to hear and he is wealthy beyond measure from the money that they give they don't appear to be being punished today well how can we be certain that they will be punished well in verse 4 oh I say through verse 9 Peter says for if God did not spare angels when they sinned but sent them to hell putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness and seven others. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless for that righteous man, living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment and the, on the day of judgment. If I were to compress that paragraph into its key components, I'd say, if God did not spare angels, if he did not spare the ancient world, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, if this is indeed so, then the Lord knows how to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. There will be judgment. Until that day, we have to be vigilant. We have to be able to determine who the false teachers are, who the false prophets are. Hmm. Peter goes on to talk about the truth about these false prophets and teachers, starting in verse 10. 
This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the flesh and despise authority, bold and arrogant. They are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, though they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord, but these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. Their blots, blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They're experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness, but he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with the human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Whew. All right, there's a lot there. But that's the truth of these teachers. They follow the corrupt desire of the flesh. They don't practice restraint. They don't practice um, the Christian graces of loving and and uh, not not mirroring the world's patterns. Yeah, Peter said in his first letter that we're ambassadors of a different kingdom, and we are to reflect the conduct in our conduct the values of that kingdom, the kingdom of God. These people follow the corrupt desires of the flesh. They're arrogant. They speak with an authority that's not theirs. They pretend to know great things that they do not know. Uh, back in the 70s, there was a movement within many of the Pentecostal and charismatic parts of the Christian body where people would were ordering angels around, believe it or not. They said angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation. And they took that verse in the Bible and they took it to mean that they could order servants, uh, angels around as servants. And they would stand up in front of audiences and speak the most arrogant things. They... They spoke disparagingly about demonic spirits. And, and I get it. They're, they're, the demonic spirits are our enemies and, and we're in battle against them. I get that. But they would speak as if there was nothing to fear. Here's the truth. Angelic beings, whether good or evil, are incredibly powerful beings. And until God calls us home and we are on the other side of death's curtain, it is better for us to leave them alone. Now, when Satan attacks us, yes, you know, we pray and we speak words of faith against whatever's going on, but we don't go out picking fights. Angelic beings are powerful. If you've never been in the presence of someone who is demonized or demon possessed, I guess would be the Bible word for it. If you've never been in the presence of someone who's demonized, then you have no idea of the power and the fear that demonic beings can produce. I have been in the presence of demonized people and I have called upon the name of Jesus, but I'm going to tell you something in that moment of calling upon the name of Jesus, I was terrified because there was a power there that I did not understand and I didn't get. These people, they act as if it's nothing. Yes, we're in a battle. Yes, our enemy is the, of our soul is Satan and he has his uh, demonic minions, but they are powerful in ways that we currently are not. That doesn't mean they can defeat us because the blood of Jesus protects us. But if you're smart, you don't pay attention to them like those guys did back in the 70s. Oh, they blaspheme in matters they don't understand. Mm, they're blots and blemishes. You know, the key phrase in this whole passage I read 
is in that one part of verse 15 where it says, talked about Balaam, who loved the wages of wickedness. That is the key to these false prophets and false teachers that were beginning to infiltrate the body of Christ back then and which have continued to infiltrate the body of Christ. They loved the wages of wickedness. It's about a paycheck to them. During the, just prior to the Great Reformation where the Pope sent out priests to uh, collect indulgences, basically selling tickets to heaven. Um, it financed a great deal of building projects in Rome, but it also financed a very lavish lifestyle for the Pope. They loved the wages of wickedness. Everybody deserves to make money. Everybody deserves. Everybody deserves the right to earn money for what they do. In fact, even in the Christian body, our pastors, they deserve a paycheck for what they do. Uh, the worker is worth this hire. But when you see someone getting incredibly wealthy on the backs of believers that should be a red flag to you the pastor at our church does not hold himself up to be better than anybody I'm in a good church he doesn't make an extraordinary paycheck he supports his family he's able to raise his children but he's not wealthy and he's not rich on the backs of the believers that attend this church. But there are, there are other, I read an article the other day of a pastor standing up and chewing his church out in a Sunday sermon because he did not make enough money to get a Rolex watch like one of his contemporaries did across the city. He chewed out his church because they had not given him enough money for him to buy a Rolex. Come on. They're in love. These people are in love with money. They love the wages of wickedness. That's a calling card of false teachers and preachers. He goes on to say, these people are springs without water, mists driven by storm. In other words, there's no real substance. Uh, just as mists promise, but don't deliver rain. Just as you come upon a spring where you expect to find water and there's no water, you find it dry. These self-proclaimed teachers and prophets offer no real sustenance in their teachings and proclamations. <laughs> Peter says, blackest darkness is reserved for them for they mouth empty, boastful words. They're springs without water. And by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. In other words, their, their real target is new believers because they don't know any better yet. They don't know the word of God to any degree. They're easy to fool. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. <sighs> you know, uh, Jesus said uh, when he's talking about fooling his children, he said, it's better for them. Those that fool his children would be better for them if they had a millstone put around the neck and they were cast into the sea. It's all about deception. They're going to say what they want to say in order to get your dollars in the offering plate. This isn't every church, but there are teachers out there that do that to act like that. You can tell them by their lifestyle again. If they've escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Now, this is a curious, this verse 20 and 21 is kind of curious to me because it appears to be saying that people can lose their salvation. It says if they've escaped the corruption of the world, by knowing, our, by knowing our Lord and Savior and then become again entangled in it, 
they're worse off the end than they were at the beginning. Hmm. It's, is it possible then for Christians to lose their salvation? Is that what this is talking about? Well, if you look at this initially, it seems like that is indeed a possibility. They knew our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but then they become entangled in the world and are overcome. But this verse asserts only that false teachers have for a time escaped from worldly corruption through knowing Christ and then turn away from the light of the Christian faith and then they're worse off than they were at the beginning. But it uses no terminology like you would expect to be used of Christians, like uh, children of God, born again, redeemed, regenerate. The New Testament makes a distinction between those who are in the churches and those who are regenerate. An old Presbyterian preacher once told me that the church consists of two groups of people. Uh, the church visible and the church invisible the church visible are is everybody who shows up on a sunday the church invisible are those who are left over after the others fall away or walk away so when peter says they're worse off the in there at the beginning he's really talking to those people who for a time appeared to be part of the body of christ do a confession or a profession and then fall away, and then walk away. Um, in John's first epistle, um, he was encouraging the people because a group of believers, supposed believers had walked away from them, had left, split off from them. And he tells him, look, they left you. And by leaving you, they proved to you that they were never part of you. They were just pretenders. He's encouraged them saying, look, they're not losing their salvation. They never had it. They played the game for a while, but the truth of who they were eventually showed up. Now, maybe to clarify this a little bit, this issue about whether these are, whether you can lose your salvation or not, and whether these are false teachers or people that have fallen away from their faith, from the faith in Christ. We find it verses 21 and 22 where Peter says, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Both dogs and pigs were considered vile by the Jews. Jesus also used the designation dogs and pigs in speaking of those who oppose to God in his word. So the false teachers are unclean and they return to their pagan corruption. The dog that returns to its vomit or the sow that is washed portrays a person who has a religious profession or outward change, but no regeneration, no inner change that affects his or her nature. Their nature is not changed, and eventually such people will return to their true nature. False teachers, false prophets are a danger. And what can be our defense against such as these? Well, again, a clue up here earlier where it said, um, it says here they appeal to the lustful desires of the flesh and they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. New believers who aren't acquainted with the word, who don't understand what the word of God says. These people cannot, let's see, that's the best way to say this. They ha almost have to target the new believers because they just don't know any better. We believers who have walked with Christ for a while, who are known by God, we it is incumbent upon us to know the word of God for ourselves and not just to let the, the teachers tell us what we're supposed to believe or think. You read it. You study the word of God. You know what you believe and think. I hinted at it before, I talked about it before, 
where those who are trained to uh, discern true money from fake money, counterfeit money, they study the true money to such a degree that the minute a counterfeit dollar bill or $20 bill or $100 bill crosses their vision, they are immediately, they immediately know something's wrong with it. They might not know exactly what's wrong with it at first, but they know that something isn't right because they know the truth so intimately. It is incumbent upon us to know the truth of God. Read the Bible for yourself. Think for yourself. Understand what the word of God says. And then you will, the odds are greater that you won't fall under the thrall of these false teachers. It's, um, it's, oh, it is so important. People, you have a mind, use it. You have a Bible, read it, put the two together. Know what God says, know what God thinks. And when a false teacher or a false prophet makes their appearance, you will know. All right, good place to stop. Long, long devotional today, but I couldn't stop in the middle of this. Paige, here's my coffee. Folks, I'm out of here. Have a great day. Bye-bye. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me at page at coffeebiblepage.com. And please feel free to visit my website, www.coffeebiblepage.com to see my blog posts and to listen to past podcast episodes. I hope to see you there. Have a great day. God bless you. Bye-bye.